Welcome to the Ownership Economy podcast, the podcast that explores the people and ideas that are utilizing technology, economics, and the law to reimagine how the economy can work for everyone. Here we connect with the entrepreneurs, investors, thought leaders, academics, and politicians that are constructing the ownership economy by expanding access to broad-based ownership and democratic governance. I'm Martin Smith, and I'm joined by my co-host, Jahed Maman. We are two investors and operators that aim to use this platform to showcase the people and ideas that will shape a society that offers more economic opportunity for all. This week, we speak with James Young, the co-founder of Abridged, which develops and maintains Collabland. The son of immigrants, James has a long background as a builder and entrepreneur and is now working architecting new organizational designs through cryptography and distributed ledger technology. We talk about the organizational design of Moloch DAOs, which are pure grant-giving organizations on the Ethereum blockchain. In this discussion, we get into all sorts of features of DAOs, like the concept of rage quitting and permission DAOs. We then move on to the evolution of James's thinking about how to create short-term, mid-term, and long-term incentive alignment within organizations. One of the original lead developers of a game called Farmville, which had over a billion users at one point, James has worked at venture-backed companies, and he discusses the option of raising venture capital when building shared ownership ventures. Only a couple of years old, James's latest venture, Collabland, currently now has 3.5 million connected wallets and is associated with 13 different blockchains. Collabland allows for the use of verified credentials or cryptographic markers to identify who or what was responsible for what action at what time. It's a pretty abstract concept, but the implications are substantial. With this technology, on-chain actions attributed to an individual can accrue value in a trustless environment. As more integrations are added, Collabland will help communities attribute value to all sorts of actions taken by community members, helping everyone to share in growing economic pies. The technology may prove to be the fast shift tomorrow's most competitive organizations. We hope you enjoy the episode. Thanks, James. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for making the time. So let's just hop right into it. Can you give our audience a bit of an intro to use a person, your background in tech and otherwise? Yeah. My name is James Young. I'm CEO of Abridged. We make a product called Collabland. I've been a software developer for over two decades. Before crypto, I was in video streaming. So this is even before YouTube existed. And I did a lot of research in college with regards to video compression and video streaming. And then the video streaming, actually, because of the technology, Flash, the Flash player back in the day, opened the door for gaming. And so I uh, got into gaming, was at a company called Zynga, launched a game called Farmville over a decade ago, and then really opened my eyes to kind of what runs the internet, which is advertising. So I got into online advertising and, you know, all this ad arbitrage that was happening. It's really fascinating. And at about that time, I was uh, getting into Bitcoin. So this is prior to Ethereum. And I thought that a way to solve for advertising fraud would be to have like one central ledger. And that got me into more of the technical details of blockchain and scalability. Ethereum came along with the DAO. That really was what caught my eye. And I thought of Ethereum and the world computer as a way to reduce coordination costs. So it was really into reducing coordination. And with the online advertising background I had, I helped co-write a white paper for a product called AdChain. And we introduced or formalized this concept of a token curated registry, which serves as kind of the primitive, actually, worked with early ETH 2.0 researchers for like, you know, staking and slashing of rewards. And then also on the side was working on a DAO framework and launched that in 2019. And it's called Moloch. And actually, it was to help further along ETH 2.0 research. And so we launched that over three years ago now. So I've been doing DAOs for over three years. And then uh, a few months after launching Moloch, helped launch MetaCartel, which is another grant giving DAO. And always been fascinated in terms of how we can use technology to kind of reduce coordination. And uh, that's 
what has led to a bridge first doing a dev tooling for Web3. And Collabland, a product, initially was this reference implementation of the DAO tools that we had created. And it was this instant kind of product market fit. It's hard to explain the feeling of having this product market fit. The only thing I can kind of like a sense memory kind of thing equated to is the launch of like Farmville, where something kind of just took off. And even though you don't want to pay attention to it, you can't help but pay attention to it kind of thing. It's this weird, you know, kind of feeling. And so we doubled down and exclusively working on uh, collab land right now. Cool. Thanks for that. That was super detailed, great place to start. And so you've been, like you said, you've been here for a while, 20 years as a developer. You also worked on Farmville. I think Farmville, when Farmville came out, I was probably in the last years of college for me. And I started seeing that come out. And uh, that was a really interesting play in community building almost, right? Like I know you play, it was a single player game, but also it was, you know, multiplayer is also, you could visit other farms. You could, and it was one of the first earliest experiments in digital communities, which I thought was very interesting. So just, you know, getting into Farmville, I've seen you in other interviews and I wanted to ask you, how much did Farmville sort of influence your point of view on digital communities? Did it at all? Like how did it pull through in the rest of your career? Yeah, I think with Farmville, what really opened my eyes was the virality aspect and being able to, within a kind of a loop from a user experience perspective, how do you get and engage new users? And so that is the lens I look at when I think about Collabland and mass adoption for crypto or Web3. It's really challenging because there's all this upfront friction. So, you know, you have to download a wallet like MetaMask or install it. And immediately before you have any crypto, before you have anything to lose, you're prompted with these like seed phrase, save it. Because if you lose it, you're going to lose access to all your funds, but don't write it down in too many places because if someone sees it, they're going to take your funds. And so it's this weird kind of like friction, which I believe is important to have, but I think there is a, an incentive alignment issue because in games like social casual games, they need to be picked up within like three clicks, less than 30 seconds. But with crypto, especially if you don't have it and you need it in order to get a transaction, there's this kind of like, if you don't have crypto, if you don't have, let's say ETH, how do you pay for gas to do anything? So you have to go to like Coinbase or you have to figure out how to transition from like fiat to like crypto. And that kind of flies in the face of kind of virality. And so what you know I've been thinking about and I've wrote about this incremental or progressive decentralization or ownership. And so, you know, my take has been informed where. I don't think that like centralization is necessarily a bad thing, but as long as there's an exit or an exit to community, then I think, you know, you're okay. And so the problem with decentralized services is that once you're there, you're stuck. And so, you know, trying to balance out this, like, how do you help new users, even if you're centralized, but then be able to progressively decentralize? And so we, we have a lot of things that we're doing from a user perspective to help with a progressive decentralization. And then we also have a lot of initiatives along a similar vein from an organization perspective. So where you can start as a centralized organization and then eventually evolve into a decentralized one. The user experience part of this progressive decentralization, I think is a little bit more well-known but the organizational aspect of progressive decentralization, there aren't many great examples of it. And right. so this is what we're experimenting with. So a lot of what we're doing at Collabland is not technical, actually. It's more organizational and kind of incentive alignment of how do we decentralize and what do we need to do on that road to exit? That makes a lot of sense. So then if I kind of remix a bit of what you said of Farmville, 
one of the big takeaways for you is just the sheer virality of it, right? Like you come in, you plant your crops, you tend them, it's super easy. And that user experience in Web3 is just like the friction. It's completely friction laden when you compare the two, right? And so when you think about that coming in, just also to reiterate too, you know, some of our listeners, we have a lot of Web3 native people on this thing, but at the same time, just so everyone knows, like, you know, when you're setting up a MetaMask wallet, which is the primary way that you'll access a lot of the things like Collabland and the things that James was talking about, right? You're going to run into things like, you think the one of the terms he said was EVMs, you know, virtual machines. This is, you can think of it as a big distributed computer and you have to, the transactions you take on the internet through say the address bar in HTTP, right? That's, you're free. You send a request, you get something back, it pops up in your browser. With EVMs, you're actually sometimes, most of the time in EVMs, you're actually paying to do that, right? And and that's because it's not centralized through one. The trade-off there is of course that we all own it, right? So we all pay for it. Whereas the other side of it, the platforms are saying, we'll offload that cost for you. We'll coordinate for you. And therefore it's free, but it's not quite free, right? And so I think that's a nice transition into then like kind of the next stage of your crypto journey, which, you know, you mentioned Moloch DAO, right? So Moloch DAOs are just for before we get into it is like this now super common pattern. Like if you look at, uh, there's a platform called DAO House that has basically made Moloch DAO a pattern, right? Where if you want to start an organization, they've made Moloch DAOs extremely easy for you to spin up where you say, I want to have a wallet. I want to have certain design patterns, which we'll talk about like rage quit and all that. But really, before we get into that, can you tell us a bit, you know, you came out of Farmville, you found crypto, you got into Moloch DAO. When did you join Moloch DAO? And, you know, how did it take shape? Yeah, I think we had started it around 2017, actually. And it was this like, I actually could dig up the paper. It's like, the, we were trying to do YC without the YC, where you don't have a centralized accelerator. And we had this idea of different types of roles where you had investors, you had customers, and you had builders, and they all came in. And it was this initial idea of being able to like crowdsource or crowdfund a startup. That was the kind of initial idea. And then, you know, you had the whole ICO boom and bust of like 2017, 2018. And so while we were developing Moloch from 2017, and when we launched in 2019, you know, our thoughts had changed a bit. We wanted to make sure that this was regulatorily compliant. And we also wanted to make sure that, you know, we can get this released because what had happened, if you actually go back to Twitter toward the end, I think of 2018, there was a lot of issues with kind of getting grants for ETH 2.0 research. And so I think it was, I don't know who it was, uh, some uh, ETH 2.0 researcher said, you know, we need funds else, you know, we got to stop doing this work. And then Vitalik, you know, said, what's your ETH address on Twitter? (laughs) And then just, you know, sent a link to an Ether scan of, I don't know how much it was. And, And then that quickly spread to other ETH 2.0 researchers saying, how about me? How about me? And I think he did it like two or three times. Nice. And this was at the end of 2018. Yeah. And, you know, I think, yeah, we were like, you know, in, in a bear market. And it's like the first version of uh, drop your ENS, huh? <laughs> yeah, essentially. <laughs> essentially, yes. Yeah. yeah. And then and then we're like, there has to be a better way. So we we're like, OK, we have this Moloch thing. And it was kind of complex. And it was really just a kind of a fun experiment. And just to us, at least for me, trying to learn the boundaries of solidity of what you can and cannot do. And, you know, we're like, we got to launch this at the next ETH Global event, which was at ETH Denver, which was, you know, this ha- we decided, I think, in November or December, and ETH Denver was in February. So it was like, how do we finish this? How do we make sure that we're also not, you know, kind of breaking any laws or anything either? So we whittled it down to like the minimum viable, like, thing that you can do. So, you know, the original version of Moloch didn't have like a token. You bought in and there was shares. And, uh, you know, we were looking at, I mean, he started Avalanche and he had this breakdown of the DAO and like, not only was a re-entrancy bug an issue, but like the game theory was kind of off for the original DAO. And so we studied it and Amin came up with this concept called Rage Quit. 
yeah uh, that, that's what i mean by great this is great like this is the design decision so on for our you know for our pod and our you know listeners right sorry to cut you off but like this no is a, this is perfect like we are really interested in this idea of the ownership economy right and to us that really means like how do we wed you know participation from both labor investors a bunch of other folks in patterns of governance and then how do we also have rules or new patterns in place for the design of organizations to also share economic upside and ownership right so some of the patterns of moloch DAO are pretty interesting like the one you're about to get into right around like rage quit which is like when you think of uh, a traditional you know institution maybe the closest thing to it is like uh you know maybe maybe you join zynga right everyone who walks into the door at zynga would probably get a one-year cliff with a four-year vest on some of their stock on their ESOPs, right? But you know, maybe eleven months into it, you have a bad interaction with your boss, and that's it, you're out, right? So, like, but when you look at something like Moloch DAO, when a group of friends or a group of people who want to go raise money for ETH 2.0 research, right? Like, say, hey, I contributed something to this, and now I want to leave, right? Can you talk to us a bit about like how do some of these patterns of governance, like rage quit, come to mind, right? Maybe we can start there. Yeah, I think, you know, the closest thing I see in the real world was, I don't know if Netflix or Zappos or even Amazon does this anymore, but like when you're employed at those companies, they actually will say, okay, I think it was Netflix that said, if you ever want to quit, we'll give you 10 grand. So you're having to like make this choice, like, do I stay in or do I go out? And so that was kind of what has informed us because, you know, you don't want your funds, if you're going and putting funds into Moloch, into a DAO, how do you know that those funds are not going to get captured? And so we had the similar concept of being able to exit whenever you can, because if there's a big group of plutocracy that comes in or someone that tries to rally the troops and say, hey, vote on this proposal and you don't agree with it, how do you exit? How do you leave with you know, your toys? So I think a lot of people uh, focus in on you know, how do you join? How do you get something going? But what we wanted to do is balance it out with like, okay, what happens when you leave? The interesting thing about DAOs Specifically, because of the nature of a blockchain, you know, theoretically, they can live in perpetuity forever. And so, you know, how do you wind down an organization? How do you like leave and how do you exit? And so these are the things that we are thinking about just to make sure that we can keep things fair because you're dealing with, you know, potentially thousands of anonymous people all over the Internet. Right. And so you have to put these safeguards and these rules within I think the contract in order so that people know that what you're doing is fair and and game theory, there's this notion of like what's called a grim trigger, right? So if just knowing that you have the ability to rage quit prevents someone from even trying to like take over a DAO because you know that there's a an escape hatch or a kind of a, a kill switch, if you will, and you'll be the one that's left holding the bag. So knowing that it's kind of like, you know, it's a prevention mechanism at the same time. Got it. No, that makes a ton of sense because when you think of traditional organizations, right? Like uh, the only folks who are empowered to make these kinds of decisions and, you know, pretty much just <laughs> put all their, put everyone else in the organization, give them the shit end of the stick, right? Is, you know, one of the examples I think of, because I come from digital health in, um, you know, product management and digital health is there's a company a while back called Practice Fusion, right? And Practice Fusion was bought by all scripts and Practice Fusion was a money loser for many years, raised over a hundred million dollars. But what ended up happening was that the management and board approved a plan that essentially got them acquired for nothing for the investors, but the management and board got something in the range of like $50 million of the $150 million purchase price and everyone made out like bandits, right? But that's just I'm not saying anyone is bad for that necessarily, right? It's just the nature of the thing. So when you're designing something like a Moloch DAO organization, you, you've you thrown game theory out there a couple of times, right? You actually have to model these scenarios and say like, well, it's a more flat power structure. How do we actually design the incentives such that if someone wants to leave, they don't, a lot of people might want to leave. One person might want to do a 51% attack or something depending on the chain, right? And so we have to design for that scenario. And it sounds like this is kind of how rage quit came to be. Yeah, I think it was just kind of these constraints and 
when we started, we had like multiple tokens and we had all this fancy stuff because it was really just, okay, pushing the bounds of solidity and what we can do and what we could imagine. But then knowing that we had to launch in like a few months, we're like, okay, let's kind of whittle this down until it's like core. And I think that, um, you know, it was easy and simple too. So I think that if we would have launched a more complex version, it might have not have taken off because I think part of like, you know, before Moloch was launched, there was this whole PTS DAO where people from 2016 were like, you know, DAOs will never become a thing. You know, there's such a bad experience. You know, it led to the hard fork. And so DAOs are almost like a bad word. And so when we brought it back, we're like, okay, we've got to make this super, super simple so that everyone can understand it. And I think that is part of like, I guess, game design as well because then people are more inclined because they can understand the system. And it, it is very simple and it was very basic, but I think that was kind of by design as well because we didn't have the time, but a, a second order effect of not having time was to keep it simple. And that allowed people to better understand um, the mechanism of like, what does this DAO do? So James, just on this, I'm trying to understand what, rage quit solves for, right? So in a traditional digital co-op like Stocksy, mm -hmm. when you exit, you're actually not allowed to bring your money or the asset with you, right? And so in, under cooperative law in Canada, and I think also in the United States, like there's no ability to individually monetize kind of your underlying security, your underlying ownership in the asset. And the philosophy around that is that you don't want to create this paradigm where effectively the the bundling of the ownership among this group of people that have similar interests suddenly gets liquefied through more and more people exiting right on the flip side of that you've got this concept of a poison pill right within organizations that essentially create a poison pill within the the architecture of a traditional organization so that normally a publicly traded company so that when a hostile takeover happens, there's less incentive for a hostile takeover to happen. And so what I'm trying to understand is what is Rage Quit actually trying to solve for? And does it have a basis in kind of traditional organizational theory? Yeah. So just to clarify with Moloch, there's no way for a user that's a member of the Moloch DAO to gain anything financially. So if I were to put in one ETH. And if you were to put in one ETH, we would have two ETH in the DAO. And so when proposals come through the DAO, the money is spent from that collective pot. There's no way of accruing value in the DAO unless more people come in. So uh, Jahan, if he comes in and we haven't spent anything, now we have three ETH in this shared collective. And then we would submit proposals to draw from that, that shared pot until it goes down to zero. So with Moloch DAOs, it's purely grant giving. And the only way to keep that treasury filled is to get new members on board. And so the idea with Rage Quit is similar to, as you described, this kind of like, you know, I guess poison pill, because what happens if, you know, Jihad and I were to like collude together against you and like, have these proposals that are submitted. And you're like, wait a second, I don't agree to these proposals, but your one ETH is still locked up into the DAO. What you can do is if you did not vote yes on that proposal during this grace period. So the grace period is when the proposal has passed before the money leaves the coffers, there's this grace period. And during that grace period, you can rage quit because you can say, you know what? You guys are doing this hostile takeover of the DAO, and I don't agree with it. And so I'm going to, during this grace period, take my proportional share out. So, you know, there'll be two ETH minus gas fees or whatever the case may be left in the DAO when you rage quit so that when the proposal, it's passed, but the grace period allows for you to have some time to exit. The, you get all your money back. And now those that are left are going to like be paying for this proposal. So it's really to help help so that, you know, if there is this like plutocracy that forms over time and you don't agree with it, that, you know, you're not 
subjugated by like majority vote, even though votes pass be a majority vote. And if, if I rage quit, am I allowed to come back into the Dow? Is there any kind of freeze out period? Because I imagine that you could have the situation where people just don't agree on things, right? I can rage quit, the vote passes, and then I'm like, okay, I'm actually going to come back in two days later and actually participate in this DAO again. Do you have any rules around that? Yeah. So the Moloch DAO is a permission DAO. And so you need a champion to advocate for you. And so if you were to rage quit and you're like, hey guys, you know, I thought about it and I, I kind of want to get back in, you would actually have to have one of us submit a proposal for your membership again. Cool. Awesome. Thanks nice. for the explanation. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then like, you know, just to revisit some of that for the folks who aren't hip to it, the PTS DAO that James is referring to is the original DAO hack, which was the first DAO literally called the DAO. And I believe at the time it was something like an $11 million hack or something like that. And it became like, as of course, that was 2017 prices and 2016 prices. And so you're looking at, you know, that's now like a billion dollar hack, but that caused the fork, right? And so the fork ended up creating Ethereum Classic and ETH Ethereum, where one segment of the participants in this blockchain decided that they do not actually honor the hack. And so that hack is still alive. It's called ETC. Everyone else continued the blockchain into Ethereum, just so, just to fill that in for you folks. Awesome. So I think, you know, these experiments, dabblings, design decisions around governance and shared ownership, um, you know, I'm kind of spiriting this in, you know, when I look at your journey through this, I think like, great, you know, you you did Farmville, you got into Moloch DAOs, you put a lot of thought into some design decisions around how organizations would actually work on chain. And if I look at it from the outside, it's like, oh, well, of course that would lead to notions of shared ownership. But you know, what is the actual story? When did you get introduced to this idea of shared ownership, community ownership and all that? So like I am a, a child of immigrants and in Korean culture, you know, there is this kind of financial grouping that you can play into where you just get a bunch of people and you get together and then you share a pot. And, you know, my parents immigrated to the United States in the 70s. And back in the 70s, it was not like it was today when it comes to immigrants and being able to get a job. And so being an entrepreneur was really like the only option for a lot of them. And so you have these ethnic communities that come together and they're not going to be able to get financed by a bank to start a grocery store or a dry cleaner. And so I think it was just always there in me culturally and different cultures have different like takes on this, but that's kind of where it started. And like growing up, it was going to, you know, family, friends, places. I didn't know they were talking about business because they were dealing with these like financial group assets that they were sharing together. And so it was just kind of part of life. And so I've been around it and familiar with it for a while. And this is just kind of like a more efficient automated way of doing it. Because, you know, if you look, there are sometimes these sensational stories where there's this one person who's trusted in the community that's in charge of like collecting all the money and then redistributing it like a bank, but they'll run off with the money or they'll just ghost. And so, you know, this is just, a, I think, an evolution of that. This is just an evolution of, and I think of it as inevitable, right? You know, I was old enough to remember when Amazon first started or e-commerce first started when they had SSL. And now you can finally safely put your credit card online where I remember the day online, you would never put your credit card information online, but it's like, it's kind of a foregone conclusion. And back then I was like, okay, e-commerce is going to be huge. It's just so convenient. And now we have, you know, Uber Eats, DoorDash, you know, all this delivery stuff. And you can buy and sell cars and houses online without ever having to deal physically going to an office. And so, you know, I think that this is an inevitability. And I grew up with it in the offline analog world. And so it just seemed natural to me. It's like, I don't think of it as like an innovation. I just think it is at the, as the next step. 
Nice. Uh, that's super interesting. I don't think, you know, I haven't met too many people who see it that way, but I certainly do. You know, if I'm revealing my own sort of political position about it in terms of just, it's really more of a, a consequence of complexifying society and like complexifying, you know, you have, if you think about, you know, money systems, energy, and a bunch of ways we organize each other, it requires a certain amount of energy and throughput for us to actually complexify the way we relate to each other and produce things through complex supply chains that energy goes down things get simpler and so i think one of the ways that that the society complexifies is through shared ownership right more decisions more perspectives integration of these things so that we can actually pursue new ways and innovate together right so i think that's a super interesting perspective I, it's funny i expected you to mention like oh well you know nathan schneider or whatever like push me in this direction <laughs> so that's awesome i know you're out in colorado so that was yeah. like, my thing I'm like, oh, not, well maybe nathan got to him so that's super interesting yeah um, i know. feel like i've been living in this like parallel universe to nathan schneider and so like when i talk to him and we've had lunch together i'm just like whoa this is like you know it's just like we're different cultures are different countries, but kind of doing the same thing. And so as these worlds collide, you know, you have, you know, different ethos and different values. And it's just kind of trying to navigate this and think of new things that we can do now that were not technically possible. And so that's why to me, like, I also want to make sure that when we, you know, are enthusiastic and we delve into this, we also make sure that you know, we keep a mind's eye in terms of what are we creating and why, because, you know, I don't think like the current state of like Fang and, you know, all these Web2 companies, when they started 25 years ago, didn't necessarily think that they would become what they are now. There may be systems in place that push them there or toward that. And so I think it's just being mindful and being careful in terms of like what we're creating now. That whole, I don't know, is it like, is it, uh, I don't know what reference it, I think it's Batman, right? Where you're you're the hero and then you live long enough to become the villain. So you want to make sure that as you're going and you're enthusiastic about what you're building, being mindful, I think for me, it's like, is what we're building sustainable? And this is where it's like this equilibrium, always this balance is always in play. And that kind of is the kind of ethos or the value or the philosophy of like, like a rage quit, right? Like you can put money in, but what happens when things go bad? How do you how do you unwind that easily? Got so it. I think it, it's that balance that you always have to be mindful of. I think you backed into it really because this is where I was going. Is really just uh, now that you got here and this mindfulness that you speak of as well is that pretty much what you would say why a bridge is doing community ownership exit to community for uh, collab land. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have any interest in being like a social network for crypto, the Facebook of crypto. You know, I think we know what happens with incentives. And what's important is to ensure like short, mid and long term incentive alignment. And that's really tricky because you're doing that while a market is emerging. And so for us, you know, we had an opportunity early on in our hockey stick growth uh, to take venture and some venture investment, but we decided not to because we know that incentives start with funding. And so this is why we want to make sure that we're always in alignment with our customers. And it's really interesting with crypto, with Web3, how you the roles get morphed, right? So if you take Web1, you had like a producer and a consumer. You had like the newspapers, the yahoos of the world. It's broadcast technology. And they were doing what they only knew of, right? Because you had television and radio. From a technical perspective, it was one-way communications. Now the internet comes in and now you have web 2.0. And this is where like social media has come into play, where the consumer can also become the producer. Web 3, you have this really interesting concept of this aligning of different roles. Like I can buy into a DAO, I can be an investor, I can be an employee and work for the DAO, right? Um, Or I can also help the DAO move into other areas. I'm the employer too. So, and I'm the customer. So you have all these mixing of these transactional relationships together. And I think that's what I see in terms of like where we're going with 
Web3 and what we need to, to be mindful of as we move forward and we think about community ownership. And, you know, I, I think people are very excited about community ownership, but we don't quite understand it because, you know, the analogy I say is it's like, you know, we're used to renting. We're renting on Facebook. We don't own the property there. Now, let's say you want to become a homeowner. There's no like calling up a landlord. I lost my keys. There's no calling and saying, hey, you know, something broke. Like I'm responsible for it. And so I think that's kind of the balance that we're trying to prep for is like understanding what's the minimum viable responsibility over time and how do we, and I guess this is where my gaming background comes into play. How do we create this mastery path where you're a novice at first, you're level one of a game, but then level 10 is like full ownership. So instead of like day one saying, here's the keys to the house, you can progressively learn at your own pace what it is to like have that ownership and community responsibility. And so this is why for us, we start centralized and we're trying to, from an organization perspective, figure out how do we decentralize before we have the means to do so. Because we're it's almost kind of like working out or practicing before the big game. Because once you decentralize, you can't go back, right? right. These technologies... And that's kind of the thing. It's, you know, it's more like sending a, an astronaut into space. Once that rocket leaves, you, you can't just say, oh, like, oh, there's a bug or there's an issue. Let's bring it back and try it again. Right. And so this yeah. is why, you know, we have to be thoughtful about this because you have that like one shot. So you had like, there's so much to respond to in there. And I'm going to come back to this but before we get further. I do want to ask you real quick. Can you tell us what Collab Land does, right? Because it's super, honestly, it's like a super important thing that everyone uses in Web3 for the most part. Like if you have a token gated community, if you're on Discord, if you're trying to get contributors up to speed, there's something like, uh, what is it? There's thousands of communities and there's uh, 10 million at least like wallets who have interacted with Collab Land. So tell us a bit about that before we get into it further. Yeah. So with Collab Land, you can think of it as like a, a nightclub bouncer. And these like different chat channels as being in the nightclub. So you have to come to the door with an asset and the community mod or admin defines what that token or that asset qualification is. So if it's an ERC20 token, a fungible token, it could be just you have to have X amount of this token. If it's like an NFT, you know, you're like, OK, it has to be you have to have at least two or three of these NFTs, one of these NFTs. We also do what's called metadata gating. So like if you have, let's say like a board ape and you want just the heart sunglass private channel, you can gate just based off of a trade or quality of that NFT. And if you were to move those assets, once you're in, if you move those assets out of your wallet, the bot will like kick you out. So it's really just a, this, I considered it like a minimum viable kind of collector space where you know, you know that everyone else that's in that chat holds or has shared interest. And what was what's really interesting is that that changes things, right? Because it's like going back to that whole Netflix. If you don't want to work here, here's ten thousand dollars, and you can leave. So you're always making this like adjustment in your mind. Do I want to spend time in this channel talking to these people or do I want a GTFO because I'm just going to sell my asset and I can join as something else? So what we're seeing with these like gated channels, this exclusivity is just higher con conversation quality because everyone's motivated and in it. And you like if you don't like it, it, you know, if you are not providing value to the conversation, why don't you just get out kind of thing? So it's just like this, it sounds cliche, but this like good vibes only kind of thing where we're all just trying to be as productive as possible because we have these assets on the line that we're trying to accrue value for together collectively. So that's the basis of Collabland. You know, we started in like 2020 and it took about a year or so to get to a million connected wallets. So October-ish of last year, we had a million connected wallets the beginning of 2022, we had 2 million. And at the, the middle of February, when I, I gave a talk, so I pulled up some vanity metrics, uh, we had about three and a half million connected wallets. 
and we're on 13 different chains and we're on telegram and discord and uh, it's this basic notion of like token gated access so the assets that you own serve as the access control list right so like on a computer you have root access administrator access or guest access you can do the same thing but you control that access by your on-chain assets Got it. Can you, can you James, oh, give an yeah. example for people that aren't kind of in the, the Web3 or the crypto space for like an application of this technology that could affect like a billion people, right? Because it's a really kind of, it's a primitive technology or it's a primitive that effectively can, is being used by, I wouldn't say insiders, but a very small kind of relatively small group of kind of the Web3 community now that understands and wants to participate in these digital communities through gated access. And, and now increasingly you can, you know, into offline parties, right? So you'll actually have kind of, you have to have this NFT to get into this party, but what are some applications of this that actually affect like the average person? And how do you see this technology playing out five to 10 years from now or one to two years from now? So we started with token granting access to different roles. And I do think like, you know, what's really popular or what's kind of caught the zeitgeist or mainstream imagination is NFTs, right? And so when you peel back NFTs, I think what you see are online native startups, right? And they're just crowdsourced startups. So I think that like the future of work, the future of like how people can organize have this option now of starting online natively at first. And what we're seeing now is these second order effects of what does that mean? And I'll give you an example, right? Let's go back to the Bored Ape example. Like at Collabland. I hate to do this, right? But just yeah. for this audience, because we're trying to pull in people from macro. Sure. And, okay. Yeah, so what is a Bored Ape? Oh, sorry. So Bored Ape is this NFT project where there's 10,000 of these NFTs. And if you like the art and you like the community, you would buy one and you get access uh, to other people that hold this board ape. And it's just a, an NFT. It, they're, they're called profile picks or PFPs. So they're, you know, usually typically 10,000 of them. And you can go to like OpenSea.io, you can type in board ape yacht club or BAYC, and you can see, you know, the prices of them. And there is this game that gets played of like holding and collecting and adding value to the community, which that value accrues supposedly to the NFTs themselves. So if we're all part of this like NFT community and you do some work that raises the value or increases the demand of the NFT, we all of us get to share in that. Right. So it's like this is where the collective ownership comes in. So, you know, what we're seeing now is these like second order effects when it comes to asset ownership. So you may have a board Abe, but you may have gotten in when, you know, after the hype or at the peak of hype, whereas Jihad might have come in really early on. So with Collabland, we can use the same cryptography. It's called a verifiable credential. And what Collabland becomes is a witness to those that were early in on board Abe. These are signed messages using cryptography they are not on chain. So it's free. It's gasless. It doesn't use cryptocurrency. So it's cheap. So this is how we scale to a billion, five billion, the whole planet, because you're not having to pay anything for this, but you're using the same cryptography. And what you're what you can do is take these VCs. And now when you want to start another organization, you don't have to start at level one because now you can prove it's been proven that Collabland has been a witness to you being job being there at like the first six months of board eight, which is like the pivotal moment in terms of getting everything off the ground. He can take that and he could start a new community with those credentials. So what we're seeing is we start with on chain assets that unlock privilege to on different platforms and what you do and the actions that you take on these different platforms now can be verified using cryptography and that data of what you've done actually can accrue value. So essentially what we're moving toward is like verifiable reputation that uses cryptography. And I think that will be the next unlock for the next billion people. 
Now it's not about who you know, what you know, it's about what you've done. And you can prove that on the chain, right? And you can prove that to anyone on the internet, as long as they have an internet connection. And so what we're doing is we're on Telegram and Discord, we're moving to Reddit and onto GitHub. So if I'm a developer and I contribute code to a DAO, I can get a VC in GitHub from my actions in GitHub. I can take those VCs over to Discord and that can unlock certain other features based off of how people are organizing. So it's just using cryptography instead of like, you know, kind of your reputation word of mouth or your LinkedIn or, you know, that it's difficult to verify. And now you can have, I think, and this is what we're working toward is like, how can you have true meritocracy? And this is kind of the kind of next evolution, I think, of online organizations. Cool. I don't want to use the word meritocracy around Jaha or we'll go down a a real rabbit hole. Oh, Uh, sorry. uh, Sorry. (laughs) So if I can like explain it in layman's terms, right? Let's imagine that Airbnb started out and it wasn't going to be a venture-backed startup. And it was going to essentially think about, okay, how do we get all the hosts that are on the platform to have an ownership stake? And what I want to do is I want to reward early contributors, right? And I want to reward people that are consistently engaged, people that are consistently hosting on the platform. What you're saying Collabland can do is that there's a cryptographic signature, right, from participation where you can essentially have this verifiable kind of chain of events that show that you have taken these actions. So in an asset marketplace like Airbnb, you've been on the platform since this this date, you've hosted this many people. In a labor marketplace, you've accomplished these goals. In an NFT marketplace, you've essentially contributed these cool sunglasses to this board ape, which has increased the value somehow, which I still don't understand. But like effectively, like you can essentially disaggregate and create this composable kind of layer of actions that essentially contribute to the reputation score of an individual or of an asset or of whatever thing that you're trying to essentially measure in a way where everyone trusts what's being measured. And that's essentially the real value here of Collabland and and where it gets out of kind of the Web3 and the crypto community and it goes to, to everyone. It's essentially a proof of whatever, right, in a very, very cheap and efficient way. Yeah. And I would add to that because that is correct. A lot of people will kind of their minds go to mechanism design of like, let's launch a token with these incentives. And like, you know, so this is where a lot of like ICOs, tokens, all they, they come out. I think verifiable credentials are similar, but yet different because they don't hold any initial value. And I think the problem with a lot of like, projects is they try to map out this future world and they have this mechanism design that they start out with because they think the world will go a certain way with the game that you play with the tokenomics. What I'm saying with verifiable credentials is I have no idea which VCs are going to be valuable. Hindsight is 2020. So let's value them in the future and not put any value on them now. And so You just need these VCs are like breadcrumbs because that GitHub action that I did, that that code that I put in, like I had no idea, but it led to like, you know, all these other projects using it and it's become foundational. And so I didn't know that when I came in and I was like, oh, I got paid a hundred bucks to do that. Great. Like, but then it led to, you know, I don't know, multiple projects inherently using it. You don't know what to value it until after the fact, before you've done it. And so VCs allow these like billions of breadcrumbs all over, and then people can price and value that when they want to. You don't have to say, here's my token economics. So I think that using cryptography to verify, and that's basically what a blockchain does, but it does so in a way where the game is that you have the scarce digital asset. And that's how value gets accrued, depending on supply and demand. What I'm saying is we're using the same cryptography, 
Don't put any value on it, but price it when you want to price it. So I may not like three years later be in a have an opportunity to start my own DAO, and I'm gonna want for whatever reason, whatever that DAO is, want certain people to be in that DAO. So I will token gate that DAO based off of the VC. So anyone that meets these requirements and can you know verify it with these VCs automatically are members. So it helps reduce that coordination cost for things that we don't know about in the future. And this is how we can use the same cryptography, but not infer an initial value because we don't know for a lot of our actions if they're going to be valuable or not. We hope they will be, but we don't know. And I think it also, it gets it. So it does what you're saying, right? Where it essentially allows for this deal, allows for you to kind of build these gated communities based on reputation, but it also does two other things. And we talked about this on the podcast a week ago or a couple of weeks ago, where we were talking with um, one of the founders of Myco, which is that it actually solves the accounting issue around how do you get people involved where they have ownership, but you don't create an accounting, accounting nightmare for them, right? And an entire kind of methodology around regulation and tax incentives has, ari- has arisen around ESOPs. And effectively, what you're doing here is you're creating a similar credential where you say, I'm going to create this cool gem, right? Or I'm going to create this cool kind of piece of code in GitHub that other people can utilize. I don't know if people are going to utilize it, right? But the challenge around open source software is that if a bunch of people utilize it, I'm not going to get paid for it. And so how do I effectively contribute and hope that I have upside, but also not preemptively value that upside such that I'm a foul of of, um, SEC regulation and effectively have to pay tax on whatever the value is associated with those tokenomics. The second thing that I think it achieves is that it achieves kind of getting back to, and this was, you know, Mark from Myco kind of brought this up, you know, why we actually do these things, right? Which is not the extrinsic reason. We're not motivated, most of us that are kind of creating with these communities around like trying to discount back the tokenomics of my action. If we lived in that society, it'd be a really bland, boring society. Instead, what we should try to do is figure out in the way that we're valuing things, how do we get rid of the people that are rentiers? How do we get rid of the people that actually just capitalize on other people's assets after the value's already been created? And I think like, so an example in kind of common parlance would be, you know, I forget who bought, I don't remember which kind of member of the Trump administration bought the rights to Seinfeld, right? But that was kind of a really sad thing that happened, right? And so effectively what you're trying to do is get rid of that outcome through a cryptographic kind of means of building these digital fingerprints within like our composable labor and the things that we contribute to very early on so that the when those things kind of accrue value over time, that value is not expropriated from whoever the creator was. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there's this backlash based off of that in Web3 where you want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's start a decentralized Twitter. Let's start a decentralized something or another, which I think will happen. But I think that we don't really know what this coordination means yet, right? Like it's similar to how let's say the motor vehicle came to play, right? Engines are measured in horsepower. Why? Because that's all we had before the engine was there. And so what does 300, 600, 500 horsepower mean? Like, I don't know, like 500 horses? Like, how do you get 500 horses together to prove that this engine is as fast as 500 horses all strung together, you know, racing, right? Like, what does that mean? I think in the same way, we don't know what decentralization and coordination means. And so what we're doing right now is saying, we're just going to get a better Twitter. We're going to get a better Facebook. But that's just like trying to measure your engine and horsepower. It's like very crude because it's what we know. And so that's why for us at Collabland, we don't have our own platform. We go, we're this connective tissue between web two and web three. Because if we go back to the analogy of like, these platform owners being landlords and all of us being serfs, right? Like with Web3 and these tokenized communities of value, we can actually like put up free commercial real estate on their land. So it's, there's this equanimity that's happening. And I think balance is always important. So when you're talking about value extraction, we also have to you know, allow for you know, people to kind of 
speculate as well. So there's, there's always this balance. And this is where, you know, I guess for me, it's this kind of running thesis or thread, like, okay, what does this empower? And what happens if we go overboard? How do we make sure that we can create this equanimity? So instead of like a web three Twitter, where I was the first developer of it, so I have the most tokens, right? Like we can use Twitter, but then have other communities like I don't know if you had token gated tweets or whatever it, it you may have in the, or like token gated DMS, right? So you have to have my token in order to DM me or reply or something, you know, I, I don't know, but like, I think that there's a, a way of being able to have this kind of balance where, you know, if you take a look at it, it's like, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater because there are literally billions of dollars across these platforms that have been spent to examine user behavior and to make things nice and easy to use. And then if we throw all of that away though, and start from the beginning, and we have these different metaphors for us to interact online, where the first thing you need to do is like, save your seed phrase and hide it before you can even start like playing with the app. I I think that kind of disruption to the kind of current mental model, it works against you. So I, I do I do see what you're saying, but I would also kind of like try to go and do that thought experiment to its full extent. Like what happens if you had that world? What what are the kind of trade-offs that you have to make? And so f- for us at Collabland, we go through these thought experiments and try to dial things back and say, okay, what can we do right now? What can we build right now? And so for us, what we've realized is that as we decentralize and we exit to community, For Collabland, it's not about technically, you know, how do we decentralize? It's mainly about organizationally, how does centralized corporation become decentralized? There's no playbook for that. Like we're making this up and it's context dependent. But when we exit to community, like, you know, how do we do that in a fair and responsible way so that, you know, we're not like majority bag holders and, you know, there's no incentive for other people to join. And so it's like, and I see this a lot. You see this, what they call decentralization theater. It's like, it looks decentralized, but when you look at it really like, "Mm, not really, right? The same kind of, you know, actors in previous models are just using crypto or tokens, different rails, but the systems are from like a, you know, who owns what still kind of the same. So I think, you know, there's a lot of things to be mindful of here. And it's like this really complex, multidimensional problem. But I think it's just, you know, trying to be thoughtful about it as well. And so I think that there's balance both ways. Got it. And I think like that's a great point to then kind of bring this home as we look a bit closer at how you folks are thinking of ownership in your uh, communities you serve, right? So just to sum up the last few minutes, right, there, the way that you, this is, I don't know if you plan it this way, but it's just for me, it's kind of genius. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass, James. I just really, when I saw your the two talks you gave at East Denver, it's just a amazing opportunity, right? Because you're sitting there, you for our you know our audience who hasn't never gone through Collab Land, right? You have like we said, there's maybe a community, people who are working on a problem together, and to enter the community, you have to go to, let's just make it easy. You go to Coinbase, you buy whatever tokens, you put those in your wallet, the Collab Land bot verifies you have them, and now you can work in this DAO, right? And now you enter there, you have a few interactions, great, but then the trail of data, the things that come with you along there, you know, as you and Martin were riffing on this, they leave, there's this, tra- this data trail of actions you've taken, things you've been around for, where certain inferences can be made about the value you created, right? So that opens up things like, for instance, you've talked about already verifiable credentials, but then also like retroactive rewards, right? So if I think about one of the things, right, let's put it into the, the Web2 framework with ESOPs, right? If I am an engineer and I've started at Facebook and it's 2008 and there's four years to the IPO, if I'm Justin Rosenstein, who, if you know, if y'all don't know, he was invented the like button, founder and CEO of Asana, et cetera. He, if I, that's kind of an outsized contribution to Facebook, right? So if you were sitting there and thinking of the, if I look at, you know, what happened and the user engagement that then led to the increase in monthly active users, and then Facebook was able to beat MySpace and Friendster and all these other things that were around the last wave, 
you would want to be like, yo, Justin Rosenstein, give that guy a billion dollars, right? Or whatever it is, right? And so now that you're, when I zoom back out to the last few minutes, what y'all are talking about, there's retroactive rewards, there's verifiable credentials, there's a number of things you are, you are exposed to because of the nature of how people interact with collab land. But the twist is that you're thinking of it in terms of almost public goods, right? Like yeah. things that were going to be owned and stewarded by the communities that use them. So now that we've arrived here, how are you actually thinking about this in practice? I know you said you're super thoughtful about it, but like, you know, is it going to be an inflationary token? Is there going to be, what are the hypotheses, right? And just to give you, I'll back up here. I'll give you a little bit of framing. In our, in our first episode, our second episode, we talked to Pia Mancini, who is the CEO of Open Collective. And she is currently doing the work in public approach to decentralizing Open Collective. And so they write about this publicly. They're considering the steward ownership model. They're considering you know, becoming a DAO, a number of other things. So for you folks now, just to get very concrete, how are you thinking of decentralizing and making this community and a community owned endeavor? What are the hypotheses? Yeah, I think that, well, first off, I don't have all the answers. And really me saying that we're going to decentralize at East Denver, I said this in my talk, I just see it publicly. So I don't chicken out doing it because I don't have all the answers. And so I'm just putting my feet to the fire because ultimately, you know, when it comes to crypto web three, it's all about self-sovereignty. And I think that there it needs to be an option in the marketplace for community sovereignty, right? And where users own their own data. And what does that look like? And what are the long-term incentives? I think what we're doing instead of like trying to figure out the perfect game, right? Because I think it's going to be a setup because the world changes and I can't predict the future and I don't know how the world will change, right? I think that like DAOs and like Web3 crypto, two year, three years ago, I would never have imagined we'd be in this spot right now. I think it has to do with like, you know, COVID, macro things that we cannot think about that move this Overton window up five, seven years, whatever, right? So I can't predict the future. So I can make a perfect game for where the market is right now. But I think what we're planning to do is do it in incremental kind of baby steps. And so we're going to create these layers. And so we have an internal initiative right now to help start that. We actually started it like back in October, where we have this these two NFTs. One is a membership NFT that you can claim if you just use Collabland. You don't pay for any gas or anything. And then we had this patron NFT, and it was more like this kind of breadcrumb kind of shareware, but crypto community version of shareware, like we're giving you this value and you can buy a patron NFT or not. It's totally up to you if you want to help keep the lights on. Like if you want to keep us going, you would buy a patron NFT. And so what we're doing instead of like figuring out the perfect game, we're putting breadcrumbs along the way and then seeing how we leverage them in the future. So we're just like trying to be kind to our future self by saying, what can we do now that would we, we can do and figure out retroactively? So that's kind of the approach that we're taking. We're, because I don't think, you know, if there was a perfect economic model or mechanism design that could be had, it would be, we would have it. And I've tried to think about it, but I can't think there's too many variables, right? Like this is where to me, it's like, you know, even with economics, you have to assume that people are rational, but they're not always rational. So it's like, how do you predict the future? How do you create something that's sustainable? I think you just iterate and evolve. And so this is what we're doing. And you know, there's going to be some things that will never turn into anything, but hopefully there will be things that we've like breadcrumbed along the way in terms of like what you're talking about, retroactive rewards. The thing about these retroactive rewards is you don't know what to reward until you know, you're in the future. So we're trying to plant as many of those as possible right now. And we're working with third parties. So, you know, we have a very small core team and, you know, our typical guidance would be raise a lot of money, hire a lot of people, but then that's counter to like, how do we decentralize at that point? Right. So we are forced to keep, we're, I'm forcing the organization to remain small and core and we use contractors, third party developers, and this gets us that practice. And then through these interactions, we drop NFTs, we do different things so that once we get to a place where we want to exit, we have this fertile groundwork of ways to reward that. 
like you said, like they didn't know that the like button was going to be this thing, right? But it has. So you need to be able to look backwards. So instead, I, I want to change the framework of instead of having to predict the future, I want to be able to lay enough things, keep us active so that like I can have enough fertile ground seeds or whatever you want to call them that are watered to know, you know, which things to pluck and which things to harvest and who to reward. Right. Um, so if I could remix that too, it sounds like one, making sure that you have iterations on this, you're constantly, you know, trying little things here and there to push the edge on extending ownership to the folks who use this. So like the NFTs that you're talking about, and the other side of it is preserving optionality, right? So basically making sure that you have options in the future and that you're progressively, like you said, you you stay at ETH Denver, now you got to work towards it, right? But make sure you do it in a thoughtful way that preserves your options. Because yeah, that's right. I'll tell you when I was looking at after I watched your talks, and you know, we also chatted at the Dallas with Felipe and uh, had that little roundtable. Some of the thoughts, you know, I then watched your talks, and you know, I thought of it. I honestly would say I'd probably call it the wrong way at this point. After having talking with you, is that you know, I think even in terms of stakeholder groups, right? But stakeholder groups, you don't know what those will be in a few years, right? Like your stakeholder groups now could be, you know, your web to API endpoints. You have to make sure that you have Reddit and Discord and Twitter and you know all the ones you have on your roadmap and all the ones you're live with now, the Telegram and Discord, right? If you were thinking of this in the web two way, you'd be like, well, oh, we should make sure that Telegram and Discord have upside in our community, right? So let's make sure that there's a, a delegate or if we raise funding that they're in it, right? Like that's like a, and then DAO ops people, right? Like when we're thinking about the ops people who build these communities, they need to be invested in it. But the thing is, how many of them are going to be here? How many of them are going to be here in the future? That's like a really difficult thing to predict. And so one of the models, actually, I'm going to throw this, this is kind of a curveball. I want to see what you think about this. As Martin mentioned, we had Mark Balin, who is the, his sister is, is Eva Balin, who runs the Graph Foundation, right? Graph Network. And he started an amazing company called Myco.Space, which both of us are invested in. And they are taking a really interesting turn on this with their communities. They're trying to think for the next 100 years, right? And one of the ways they're making that material is they're saying, let's take a very dilutive perspective on DAOs. Let's make sure that the shares in a DAO are inflationary, right? So like the only thing, like we want the community to build, we want the community, whatever it does to build, to create whatever it does. The only responsibility it has is each month, there'll be a million shares to distribute. Right. And they have to decide how those million shares go. And those million shares are inflationary. They're created every month from the existing shares. And there's like an algorithm or what have you that, that does that. So that in perpetuity, there is an incentive for the 3,000th person five years from now to also say, oh, there's value here and I want to create stuff. Right. But they're intrinsically and extrinsically motivated. What do you think about the sound of that? Yeah. I think that there are different ways to like kind of like minimize the free rider effect or the, uh, the the tragedy of the commons where, you know, like, oh, I got in early and I don't do anything. And then I just get all this tremendous upside because I bought in early. And this inflation helps with that. It's kind of like a tax to everyone, especially those that don't participate because they'll just get diluted out. And so I think that there, there are tactics like that. There's like slash reward tactics. I think that that can work. I think that it's really context dependent based off of what you're trying to do and how many people you have, you know, in the group. So I know Mark and I know he's building something great. I, you know, talked to him about my co uh, several times because what we're trying to figure out is what is this like next social graph look like? And we all have our own opinions on that. And so I think that it can work, but you know, the, the, the challenge that I have is, because of the nature of the technology, when you deploy a smart contract, it's there kind of in perpetuity. It was, it's a feature where it's immutable. So when you're thinking about something like inflation, it's great now, but what happens for whatever events in the world that affect people? Like if that changes some cultural norm or something where that doesn't seem as appropriate anymore, and it's really hard to predict the future. So I hate to say like one thing is the right way to do it. It might be the, a good way to do it now. I don't see any flaws in it, but I think that's one of the challenges here is to like figure out, you know, if you're going to have a, an organization that lasts hundreds of years, you know, the organizations need to adapt and does an inflationary mechanism 
um, does that sustain you know, in perpetuity for hundreds of years? I don't know. Got it. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I think now that we've kind of arrived here, I think it's a good spot to you know call it a day. We've we've taken a widening journey through you know Moloch Dow's ownership, all kinds of. Honestly, I didn't think we end up with verifiable credentials when I first was kind of you know like oh let's get James on. So that was super cool. I'm really excited to see what you folks are working on with the future of work because honestly when. I, my first interaction with collab land was probably common stack right like yeah it was definitely common stack i think so where i just you know had to get the 450 cstk and then like verify and then i got a shirt from the man from in the mail from interacting with collab land right so i was like wow this is magic i talked to a bot and i got a shirt and now <laughs> you know seeing where it goes it's super interesting that it's now morphing into this like solid you know metadata and other forms of data trail for what you've actually done in the DAO. And it, you know, people have been trying to replace LinkedIn forever. God, please, James, tell me you're going to replace LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. You know, um, actually we're talking with Microsoft on GitHub and they had mentioned integrating with LinkedIn as well. I think our perspective is that we want to play nice with the platforms as much as possible. And so, yeah, more news to come with regards to like LinkedIn. Awesome. Well, make sure if anyone from Microsoft is listening, I'm not throwing salt on that deal. LinkedIn is great and James loves it. You have it. You heard it here first, folks. So thanks a lot, James, for joining us. Last thing is that where can folks follow your work online and stay in touch with developments at Colab Land? So the best thing to do would be you can look up abridged on medium.com. We have a publication and we're going to be a bit more vocal and in public in terms of things that we're building. You can sign up for the newsletter there. We have a Twitter that also it right now it serves as a lot of just support, but we're going to make it more public facing in terms of things that we're planning to do as we decentralize. And that Twitter is a collab underscore land underscore. And you can follow that as well. And then you can follow me on Twitter, James Young. But a lot of the things that I tweet or retweet are really kind of nerdy, <laughs> I guess. Cool. Well, thanks a lot for your time, James. This has been awesome. I would say that I learned way more than I thought I would, you know, when you know, like, oh, I've been a web three person forever. And I watch your talks and I was like, yo, this is crazy. The future work stuff that's happening here. I, you know, the implications are awesome. So I learned a ton and thanks a lot, man. Great chatting with you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Really fun. I appreciate the time.